to another episode uh, of the Being and Doing podcast, where I try to create a space dedicated to the unique minds that are all around us, with the hope that their story might challenge, inspire, and stimulate your being. And I think my guest tonight doesn't really need an introduction, but uh, there is a small quote uh, that I felt like it's very appropriate to introduce him. And it says, um, I believe that the world needs more minds that are equipped to be dealing with the complexity of life. Minds that hold nuance and polarity. Minds that can stay centered, grounded, and open to the full range of what it means to be human. So this quote is from Corey Moscara, I think. And when I read it, I was like, that's Derek. (laughs) (laughs) And... uh, (laughs) And I'm actually very happy uh, because we are going to talk about your book. Uh, and I said I didn't say that my guest is Derek Sivers. Um, and we are going to talk about your book uh, on how to live. Um, and I think that ability of yours to hold that complexity of life has really been something that was kind of the most attractive about your book. So the first question is, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Alex. Uh, I'm great. Yeah, it's funny. Um, it's we're talking across the world. I think last time we spoke, I was living in Oxford. Yes. Um, but now I'm all the way across the world in New Zealand. But it's nice to talk with you again. Mm. And I always start this uh, podcast with asking, what are some words that you yourself identify with? Because you are so many things. And uh, <laughs> do you even choose words to... Um, how do you introduce yourself to people now? Oh, like that. Oh, that's two different things. There's the introducing yourself to someone is... Um, it depends on the context. The context. Sometimes you don't really want more of a conversation with somebody. Mm. You know, like if somebody's just chit-chat and they say like, oh, what do you do? And you don't really want to go into it. So if I don't want to go into it, I tell people I'm a computer programmer. Because I do spend a lot of my time programming. Um, but if I actually want to get to know somebody and want to tell them the truth, then in short, I say I'm an author. People always then say, author of what? What do you write? And I say, pop psychology. Sorry, no, sorry, pop philosophy. Mm. Um, so in sh- that's my short answer. An author of pop philosophy books these days. It would have been a different answer 10 years ago and a different answer 10 years before that. But mm. that's what it is now. I mean, it truly is philosophy. I felt like when I read the book, it, it it felt it is kind of the way I've experienced it is that you try to explore edges of thinking. So you would take a topic and then just kind of go and see how far can I get with this? <laughs> is that exactly true? That was the mission of the How to Live book. It's like, I can believe different ways that we should live. You, you could say that we should live for the future, or you could say that we should live for the present, or you could say that we should uh, focus on pleasure, or you say that we should focus on pain. Any of these things could be true, mm-hmm. or are also true, simultaneously true. So the challenge of writing the book How to Live, or maybe the creative challenge, was to take each one of them to their logical conclusion, mm-hmm. where it's like, if being independent is the way to live well then how would that look if we take it all the way to its logical conclusion Mm -hmm. and then in the next chapter it's like well if being committed to a person or a place or a career is the way to go well then how would that look if taken to its logical conclusion Mm -hmm. um in an early draft of the book i took them to more ridiculous extremes almost every chapter would end when it was taken too far you know what i mean like Mm -hmm. um the way that we can say that you could somebody can be generous but then we can say they can be generous to a fault Mm -hmm. like it means you take a good thing and you go too far with it until it breaks so in an early draft of the book every chapter went too far uh and although that was fun i felt it was distracting and after a while felt too formulaic like a M. Night Shyamalan movie where you know that it's always going to have a uh, big surprise twist at the end. You know, you could do that Mm -hmm. once, but if you do it every time, it gets tiring. I'm almost curious to see the endings because I'm like, no, mm, kind of, because that's an interesting thing. (laughs) What you're saying is um, because 
I told you, and when I approached you, that this was really reminding me of psychotherapy and how we how we work with people in psychotherapy. And it's never about, you know, people normally come to us with like, I don't want to be this. <laughs> and then you mm. kind of kind of want to be something else. Or like, I don't want to be angry. I want to be always generous, for example. And then you as a therapist know, oh, oh, if I would, you know, if I would get to that desired outcome, I'm not sure you would like yourself. <laughs> and mm, so mm -hmm. it's uh, when I was reading it, it, it I was always like, almost like, oh, I'm so angry. I, like this being dependent. Yes. Like, yeah, that's true. But but then I was going to the edge uh, with those conclusions. Right. <laughs> and so it was very interesting because I feel like I was I was making the those conclusions in myself. And I feel like that's how our brains work. So my question in this is, is like, um, what has going to those edges taught you about how to live? Ooh. I like being an explorer. Um, I like going to the edges of things to see what's there. It's a personal challenge. Um, it makes life a little more interesting than staying on the normal, moderated path. Um, so, yeah, I've always had a tendency since I was a teenager. It must just be in my DNA or, or no, I don't know. We shouldn't blame DNA. Um, mm -hmm. Somewhere early on, I just got this uh, value system. Mm -hmm. that said that it's good to go to extremes. Um, maybe because when I was a teenager, I really wanted to be a famous musician. And I knew that that's not something that happens by just living a normal, casual life. Mm -hmm. Like that's something like being an Olympic gymnast. You, The only way that you're going to uh, win the gold medal at the Olympics is to live a very extreme life to not be normal. And so I think I've always had it in my value system since my you know early teenage years to not be normal, to look for the extremes, to push myself in ways that most people don't. So mm. yeah, now that I'm not trying to be famous or successful uh, at a certain career path, I think that probably comes across in my general approach to life. So yes, if I think that simplicity is good, well, then I kind of want to push it to the extreme and see, well, how simple can I make my life? And if I feel that independence is good, then I think, well, how independent can I make my life? And if I, you know, any one of those things that are in the book, I believe them all. Mm. And I'm also curious, um, when you were pushing yourselves to extremes, uh, what was holding you to go just about to the extreme, but not breaking? Ah. I guess we all just have to have our own sense of when you're about to crash. Um, have you ever run down a steep hill? Uh, yes. Yes. You know, I'm like, trying to think of it. Yes. <laughs> like we, we often would do it more as kids, you know, there's like yes. a big grassy yeah. hill and you run down and you have this feeling of like, you know, you're just on the verge of collapsing and maybe you do actually collapse. Maybe you run mm. down a hill that's too steep and you actually fall down. Um, but then, the, you know, after you've done that once, you get a feeling for when you're about to fall down and you try to slow mm. it down right before you crash. Mm. So, you, so you felt like going to the edges was your learning, was the way for you to learn. And somehow there was something inside of you that was keeping you safe enough in that learning process? Hmm. I don't usually think in terms of safe. I think I feel capable of handling mm. whatever life throws at me, so I don't try to be safe. Mm. Was that always the case? I think so. Or I think it's a... Um, I think it's also just kind of a decision early on. Mm -hmm. Again, formative years deciding I wanted to be a successful musician gave me this self-image of somebody 
strong and resilient, able to handle the hard times that are to come. I made this part of my core identity so that I just have a self-confidence that I can handle whatever the world throws at me. Wow. And I, I'm I'm curious there as well. Uh, Wait, sorry to interrupt, but why yeah. is that a wow? Don't we... I, don't, I didn't mean that to sound yeah. like bragging. No, no, uh, no, no, no not that, at all. Uh, for me, is it's that a wow. surprising? It is. I mean, especially... Look, I would say I, I, I have it probably in myself, not so consciously uh, as you maybe, that I do have the feeling of I can take whatever comes. Many experiences have taught me that, yes, I can take whatever comes, but I don't know if I had it so strongly as, as you express it. And, and mm. even every, every now and then I, I'm, I have this feeling I'm just going to fall apart. Like the next step is dying <laughs> or like, you know, kind of that kind of level of um, uh, fear uh, or kind of a break. Does it actually feel like when you say dying, is that just being dramatic or do you actually feel that death, yeah. actual death and turning into a corpse is next? Yes. Yeah. Like literally, huh. like it's, that's the internal experience. I, I like, there is obviously an observing part of me that would be like, I know you're safe. Like, you know, no, you know, the next step is okay. Maybe just going back to Serbia or whatever. But I think. Uh, I need to bring in back a little bit of history. I've, I'm I'm from Serbia, and um, and uh, I guess the threats were literal death, like during mm. the war. So um, so it takes time to teach my body safety uh, because mm. because I guess when when you actually are exposed to a possibility that you know very early on when I was eight or nine that it's not even in your power whether we, you will die or not because you're bombarded. Right. Then I guess mm. it just creates a very different wiring um, for safety. Yeah. So I'm going to make a strange comparison, but it's funny that the story we tell ourselves or the the image that we have in our mind, like the metaphorical image of what we're doing, mm -hmm. can change your behavior. And so it's like maybe growing up in Serbia, like you said, eight or nine, in a way it felt like you were on a tightrope over yeah. a fire pit that any false move or any just, you know, a um, volcano shoots up a piece of lava out of your control and suddenly you you fall and you yeah. die. Um Whereas I grew up feeling that I had a big safety net. You know, I grew up in a rich country, but also, so I bring this up because I grew up thinking we were rich. Um, mm -hmm. It's really interesting. So my family has, like my, my dad's side of the family has a real estate development company in Portland, Oregon. And so growing up, I felt that we were rich. I would see a building with my family's name on it and felt that this was my safety net. Like, I'm going to go try to be a musician. Mm. But if all fails, well, it's nice to know that at least I can go back to Portland, Oregon, to my grandma's house and everything will be okay. Um, I knew that I wouldn't starve, you know. Um, but what's interesting is that years later, my sister was running the family real estate business. And this is just a few years ago. She called me out of the blue and said, hey, growing up, did you think that we were rich? And I said, yeah. <laughs> and she said, well, guess what? Now that I'm running the family business, she goes, we're not. And we never were. Like, I also thought that we were rich growing up, but like all of these buildings that the family business owns are completely mortgaged. Um, like if we sold all the buildings, we'd, basically break even like we're actually not rich like we're not poor but we're not rich and so I thought about that later after we got off the phone that it was almost like my tightrope uh walking on the tightrope in life 
I, I thought there was a big safety net down below. So I was very adventurous and I would take risks and I would jump up and I would, you know, uh, do brave things because I thought there was a safety net there. But there actually wasn't. Unless you could argue, you know, I had the safety net of being safe in America. But like in my family, there wasn't the safety net there that I thought there was, but it made me more bold thinking there was. Mm, that's interesting. There is one, uh, and you reminded me of one movie which is called Three Idiots, and there is a metaphor. I know Three that, Idiots. Wow. You okay. know, I love Sorry, it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and yeah. in that in that movie, there is this metaphor, all is well, and it's like he says there there is this village uh, in which every night there is a person who rings the bell to say the city is safe and everyone can sleep calmly. And after some time, and they all say to themselves, all is well. And then after some time, they figure out that this person is blind. <laughs> and although they are kind of telling them all is well, um, actually, they, they don't have the capacity to, whether, to actually see whether all is well. And it, there is even nice. a Serbian novel, um, uh, actually a short story, which is called The Leader, where the, the leader is leading them and they always think, oh, yeah, we need to go through this pain and we need to go through this through this hustle because the leader knows and then they again get to know that the leader is blind <laughs> and hmm. so it's uh it's very interesting I, I i'm actually quite happy that we opened this conversation in this way because many times because i growing up in serbia I always all obviously thought oh my god look at all these people who have money who are rich and everything that you're just explaining and then and then I think I read Michelle Obama's memoir and I was like, ah, everything has a price. And we often are not, sometimes we are not even ready to pay the price for some of the things that people consider successful or great mm. or incredible. Mm -hmm. And as you said, safety is something that we also create in our in our head so yeah i find it hmm. very interesting so i'm curious now that they mentioned the word success part of this uh part of this podcast is what is success for you now that you are successful or <laughs> hmm. to me i think success is just achieving what you set out to do hmm. and i think that's it um I don't think there's some objective measure like a certain amount of money equals success unless mm -hmm. you set out to earn a certain amount of money. Then whether you would achieve that or not is your measure of success. I don't think there's any objective measure of success except mm -hmm. achieving what you set out to do. Mm. And I'm curious, one question that stayed with me uh, from before was, uh, you said that you've gone to extremes, but you always believed that you can make it. Was there any time of where you felt like, I actually have no idea what I'm going to do now? This looks big and overwhelming. Uh -huh. Yeah, but those moments last an hour. <laughs> oh, wow. You know, then I just I, I just wish. turned to my journal. And I'm like, OK, I have no idea what I'm going to do. I mean, an, an hour tops. I think I just start writing or thinking or at very least talking with a friend hmm. of like, oh, my God, I'm feeling so lost. Or I don't know what I'm going to do. And I'll just talk to myself, you know, usually in a journal hmm. like, OK, what am I going to do? What do I want? Hmm. What am I doing? <laughs> Where am I now? How can I make the best of this? Um, what are some possibilities for getting out of this situation? What's exciting me right now? What could I do? And I just ask myself these questions. And um, pretty soon I get re-empowered. I have another wow here. And my wow is basically you have an internal psychotherapist. <laughs> and Yes. I, I learned about cognitive behavioral therapy just recently. I went, oh, that's what I've been doing since I was a teenager. Like asking myself yeah. these questions, talking through things, rationalizing, thinking, okay, challenging everything I say. Like, you know, what's, what's great about this situation? Nothing. It's terrible. Is that really true? Okay, well, I don't know if that's really true. You know, like just, yeah, 
writing to myself like that. Yeah, that's that's an interesting thing because like, you know what? There was again a difference between you and me where I was like, wow, listen to his inner dialogue. Mine is like, this is horrible. You're stupid. How could you do this? <laughs> like, you know, like there are all this like narratives of of fear and in, like being incapable or and then I'm like listening to your narrative and it's like so gentle and I'm wondering how are your how was that something that was instilled by your parents do you feel like that's how they have been talking to you no that was instilled by tony robbins <laughs> <laughs> i'm a little embarrassed to say because he's uh so cheesy in so many ways but um formative years 19 years old i joined a circus my boss at the circus was this amazingly sweet woman named tarleton and I just loved her, and she just loved me. Um, and we were very, very close. We traveled together in the circus and did 500 shows together, you know. Um, so we got to know each other really well. And she was much older, so it really mattered a lot to me when I was 18, 19, and insecure, and uh, not very insecure, but just a little bit, more like on the personal level. I think I was very secure in my skills as a musician, but insecure... Uh, when it came to, say, love life. And she said, oh, you got you to gotta check out this guy, Tony Robbins. Read this book. Um, it's so good. I think it's the best thing I've read in a long time. I think you especially need it. So there was this book called Awaken the Giant Within by mm -hmm. Tony Robbins. And I read that book because she told me to. So coming from the best recommendation, right? Somebody that I love and who cares about me told me, you need to read this. So I read it very intensely and um a lot of my beliefs come from the mindset uh taught in that book so he straight up said when when everything goes wrong ask yourself what's great about this and he said your first response will probably be nothing this just sucks he said well ask again what's great about this um or um how how could I, or uh, what should I do now? And if your answer is, I don't know, then you ask yourself, well, if you did know, what would you say? <laughs> <laughs> and they're like these little mental tricks you can play on yourself. Or if you yeah. ask yourself, all right, well, if I did know, what would it say? Um, actually, a lot of that book teaches the power of questions. And he said, because whatever question you ask of your brain, your brain will answer. So if mm -hmm. you ask yourself, why am I such an idiot? Your brain will answer that question. Here's why you're such an idiot. He said, so you have to be really careful about what questions you ask yourself. Mm. Don't ask yourself, why am I such an idiot? Ask yourself, what can I learn from this? How mm. can I make sure this doesn't happen again? Mm. How can I use this to go to a better place? Mm. Mm, I yeah, like so that. I got all that from this book at 19. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. There's one of your um, blog posts, which is, I don't remember the name, but it's around what would you ask your mentor? And then you end up mm. actually not needing to ask your mentor because you have already asked yourself all the questions that your mentor would have answers to. So, the, yeah. Well, that's the wisdom in that is that just formulating a great question is most of the hard work. So when yes. you think like, oh, I don't I don't know what I want to do. I'm lost. What should I do? I don't know. I need a mentor to tell me. Instead, if you say, okay, I'm feeling I need a mentor to tell me exactly what would I ask the mentor? If I only had a minute of their time, how would I take my whole situation and put it into a question that a stranger would understand? And then, of course, your first draft will have you know, too much information. Well, blah, blah, blah. Well, growing up with this, well, the whole situation. But on the other hand, I don't know this. It's like, no, no, no. Nobody has time for that. How do you compress that? How do you get to the essence of your problem? So then you, you define it a little better. You say, okay, well, this is extraneous information. This doesn't matter. The essence of my problem really is this, A, B, C, D. And I don't know what letter is next. But once you spell it out like that, you go, oh, wait, A, B, C, D. 
I think the next letter is E. Yeah. <laughs> and you think, okay, never mind. Don't need the mentor. I think I know what I'm doing next. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's so true because even science, I think good science is not made of good results. It's actually made of good questions. Mm. And, and basically, whenever I, when I was learning science um, or learning how to do it, I was always reading the old papers to see and all actually not even the results but the introduction of old papers because that's how they explain how they got to ask that question and mm. that's that's basically where where for me was like the most of enjoyment because i wouldn't learn anything from them explaining the results because then i would not be able to replicate how did they get to those results so right. that was uh, that was very interesting for me but Every, every time I think about you, it's like you, there is something about, uh, 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 there's one person that said poet scientist. And I feel like that's your brain's that. It's, it's a very well integrated left, right hemisphere connection. And I'm, I'm curious, um, where was there, when was the music and was the music always both left and right? How did that start for you? Or was it? Did it start as something that was more bodily embodied, and then you kind of understood the structure, or was the other way around? Sure. Um, this is an unpopular uh, perspective, but to me, music was never just pure expression. As mm -hmm. soon as I started learning music, it was always. A combination of left brain right brain right like i would i got good at guitar by doing lots of finger exercises so i'd do these patterns up and down the fretboard and arpeggios and i do one three five one three five one three five and i'd say okay one three five seven one three five seven one three five seven and then i'd add in the one three five seven nine one three five seven nine uh and just already you're doing kind of number patterns on the fretboard and then when i started learning more about songwriting and analyzing why is it that this melody works so well what is it and so you get analytical and you take a melody and you say okay it's it's that melodic leap that i love it's that it doesn't just meander like a river it's that it takes a jump like a waterfall and that's what i love about this melody and so i'd sit down and i'd write 10 melodies using that technique which already then is very analytical it's not just like oh this music is just flowing through me no it's mm -hmm. it's uh it was very deliberate and conscious but yet it's still creative it's music so it's mm -hmm. it's giving yourself a concrete assignment and doing it in a creative way um so yeah music always held that role for me and, and similar to the writing that i do now with my pop philosophy um it was always very experimental like mm -hmm. let's see what happens if i do this you know uh if taking a melodic leap is good what would be a very leapy melody i could write uh, can i do that more than that melody and then i'd say okay well that took it too far that mm -hmm. melody is too leapy um yeah it was always just very exploratory very yeah left brain right brain combination Mm. And I'm curious about little Derek, like, you know, three, five, seven years. Was that, <laughs> <laughs> was that, uh, did you remember yourself doing similar things, but not in a, such a deliberate conscious manner, but you were still like kind of, oh, can I pick this apart? When did you become conscious of this process, actually? Probably with music. I don't really know my younger, younger self well at all. It's like just faint little memories of things here and there. Um, but nothing like this. Now, really, I feel like who I am began around 14 when I first started playing guitar and said like, ooh, this is what I want to do. So that's mm -hmm. kind of when it all kicked in. Mm. And then uh, I'm curious about the book and the final wait actually i'm sorry alex wait tell me that that's i'm sorry to interrupt um i should go back actually i kind of forget about this but i think it actually started earlier with i think i was 10 or 11 when my dad brought home 
a a, a computer. And that's like 1979. Computers were not common. There was no internet. And I got really, really into that computer uh, in 1979, so much so that it became my obsession. So I was poring over computer magazines. And I think in 1982, when I was 12, I was even an assistant teacher of a computer class for adults. I got I got really good at computers and really deeply into it. And programming, right? Because at the time, there was no mouse. There was nothing to click on. You would turn on a computer, and it would just be a black screen, and you would have to type commands to make it do anything. You had Everybody had to write their own programs, basically. Um, well, not complete programs, but you had, to, you had to have serious computer skills to know commands and know what to type, even just to connect up the thing that would then load a program. Uh, but even then, it, again, there was no mouse. There was nothing to click on. You had to type commands mm-hmm. to make everything happen. And I got so deeply into that that I obsessed on it in a real like introvert kind of way, you know, like had no friends almost deliberately and just spent all my time in my bedroom, just reading through computer books and computer magazines and making programs and making things happen. Mm -hmm. And then when I started, when my interest flipped into music, uh, I took that same approach to music. Suddenly I was like obsessed with this thing. I was like trying to figure out how to be the best guitarist or how to, make the best recordings um so actually yeah I, you know I, I have to just take it back for the record because nobody would really asked me that before like when did my personality begin i really think it was more like 10 than when i got really into computers i think it's before that that i don't really remember much but i do remember being really into computers starting at age 10. Well, in psychotherapy we often ask our clients what's your first memory so what's your first memory <laughs> my second birthday. Yeah, I. <laughs> it's no. There's an interesting insight here. Um, so when I was two years, I remember turning two years old. I remember that day because there were two Rice Krispie treats on the table, and I remember my uncle came along and said, "Oh, those look good. Could I have one of those?" And I remember this feeling of like, "Ah, uh, I don't want to give him one of my birthday treats, but he's a grown up and I have to do what grown ups say. Ah, what do I do? So I remember this moment for two reasons. One, because it was upsetting. Mm-hmm. Um, but two, because there's a photo of it. I mentioned this to my dad years later that, that, that that's my earliest memory. And he said, I think that's because we had a photo of it on the fridge. So somebody took a photo just about of that moment of me at the head of the birthday table with these two treats in front of me and a kind of worried look on my face. And that photo was up on the refrigerator for years. And I think that's why it kind of kept that memory active. It's like I'd see that photo like, oh, yeah, I remember that moment. And I think that's why that's my earliest memory, because my next memory isn't until I'm five. So Mm -hmm. it's photos make a big difference. And knowing that, that's why... I make lots of videos of my kid who's 10 years old now. And I know lots of parents do this, but I actually make a point of going back and showing him older ones to keep those memories Mm -hmm. active so that he has more of a recollection of his younger years to kind of fit it into the bigger picture. Mm. There's an interesting thing that now as I'm obsessing, I I was laughing, at, uh, but I was not laughing at you. I was just laughing because you reminded me of what I do is like when I get something and I'm like, like, you know, when a kid takes a toy and needs to unpack it to really fully understand how it works. (laughs) That's how Mm. when I enter a new field. So in Serbia, we didn't we didn't Mm. get computers until about 2000, I think. So when we got them, they were already quite advanced. So the only thing that at that time we we were kind of trying to make uh, flash based games. So I remember Mm -hmm. dreaming of how is the game going to look like and things like that. So it's really interesting for me to see that different people will start obsessing at a different stage of technology development. (laughs) But um, But uh, the thing uh, when as I started um, uh, obsessing about psychotherapy is uh, is how we em- how we still have an embodied memory of things, even though we don't have a physical recollection if we close our eyes. There is the book the body remembers or the body keeps the score, 
So there is probably something, and like as you were talking, I could already see it in your face, like kind of the feeling that you remembered from that moment, and it somehow seems mm. to still be there. And I mm. was curious um, how much of of that kind of connection do you have in your left right integration of embodied experience of music of memory of um even as you are thinking because at one point when i was starting to do yoga what happened for me is i started to know when i'm thinking by knowing which muscles like you know the thinker which is like mm. um and like i was trying to, how can i actually think without this constant tension <laughs> so mm. So uh, yeah, that my question is like, what are what are your embodied experiences? I don't know. I don't think I really think that way. I think mm -hmm. that I probably, to a fault, um, am in my head too much mm. and disconnected from my physical self. Mm. That's but that's okay. Yeah. I mean, I've I've heard that I should not be like that. But it works for me for now. Yeah. And if the exactly. day comes when I feel that it's not working for me, then hopefully I'll do something about it. Yeah, that's that's interesting. So uh so when you're listening to music, where are you listening to it? Oh, in my head. See, music's a tough one now. Um maybe it'd be different if I'm looking at a painting or a sculpture or a building then i wouldn't be in my head because i don't know anything about that craft mm -hmm. um but music i'm a little too trained you know i went to i graduated from a music college like i yeah. i know too much music theory so that whenever i'm listening to music i'm analyzing in my head like i'm analyzing the chord changes i'm analyzing the melodic structure i'm analyzing the production values of how the engineer recorded the uh symbols and uh what arrangement they're using in the structure of the song like i so yeah listening to music is very heady for me mm, that's very interesting and do you dance nope oh wow that's so cool okay uh, cool as in interesting <laughs> in in getting to know you yeah that's that's the big question mark i had on you that i was like hmm this person that's so connected to so many things <laughs> but does he dance <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> yeah um and uh one other question which is uh, also part of your book is one chapter is pursue pain and uh, one question I often ask uh, in the podcast is, what is a painful experience or a pain which you think has significantly shaped you into being who you are now? Hmm. I think it's the, the pain of fear, if we can call those, it's coming from the same place. Yeah. I have a rule of thumb that I've pursued for many years, which is uh, whatever scares you, go do it mm. in this. And the next sentence is then, because then it won't scare you anymore. So over and over again, I would find that the thing that feels the biggest and scariest thing I could do is probably the right thing for me to do. And even on a small moment to moment basis, mm. um, I'm talking with somebody and I'm scared to say something to them. Then I think, well, whatever scares you, go do it. Here I go. And I'll say the thing that scares me to say, mm -hmm. which may be um, asking my grandpa, like, so how does it feel to know you're going to die very soon? Um, or mm -hmm. saying to a girlfriend that I'm in a relationship where things aren't working out, saying, I think we need to break up. You know, these things are terrifying mm -hmm. to say, but that little inner compass usually means this is what I should be doing. Mm -hmm. And then the big mm -hmm. compass of life, um, it would scare me to quit my job and jump out and take a chance on this thing. It, there's probably a, a nuance that needs to be added to communicate this idea to others because somebody could say, well, then why don't you just jump off a building because it scares you? Mm -hmm. uh, so there's probably a, uh, I don't know if it needs a better word than scares, but it's um, 
it's it's when you feel that this is the this is the challenge that would that you would rise up to this this challenge would improve you mm-hmm. that that's the thing to do that's interesting it again goes into what we were discussing in the beginning if we would take this to an extreme it can mm-hmm. be life threatening but mm-hmm. then if you find your own sweet spot i think it's a serbian expression in psychotherapy but they call it like finding your right measure uh mm then it kind of works for you and i guess it's like a work of of a lifetime to find your right measure in many different spaces i guess where was maybe the um, most difficult area for you to find your right measure (laughs) um probably romantic relationships um i think that took me the longest to find my right measure Mm. do you want to say more and you don't have to i don't know um i don't want to like involve other people in this mm-hmm. but i just say i i think that let's say at you know i, I actually kind of I've referred to this earlier when i was talking about tarleton from the circus and telling me to read this book that i think somewhere around like when i was like 12 i was really good at computers but really um like unpopular at school. I was just this mm-hmm. kind of nerd with my head down in the computers and I I wasn't friends with anybody and I think like mm-hmm. people would tease me and I think I got this insecure self-identity of like knowing I'm good at this thing but feeling like I'm not um not lovable or not desirable but kind of not caring because I'm into this thing. Um mm-hmm. But then that stayed with me where I felt undesirable. Uh, so then I think for years and years and years and years and years and years, I would pursue uh, I would pursue the wrong women as mm-hmm. some kind of like to see if I could win her mm-hmm. it, it, for my ego, mm-hmm. even though this wasn't somebody i should actually be in a relationship with because we just want different Mm -hmm. things out of life or you know Mm -hmm. um whatever but i would do that to like satisfy this 14 year old self that still feels insecure Mm -hmm. i don't do that anymore but that's what i did for many years and what do you think helped you on that journey of not not (laughs) needing to do that anymore Except many um, failed relationships. <laughs> yeah, winning, but also like, you know, winning someone's heart over and over again. I mean, winning many mm-hmm. different hearts over and over again. It finally just made me go like, I think I'm done now. I think I've done that. I think I've proven, you know, kind of like cognitive behavioral therapy, right? I think that this belief uh, of mine has been completely disproven. This, uh, you know, I'm not desirable. I think I've I've proven that wrong. So I'm going to stop this now. Or catch myself when I sense that I'm doing that again. Mm, so there, there was again the internal observer and the psychotherapist where I was like, I observe myself. I've seen I've done this too many times. I catch my pattern and then I kind of sense when I'm doing it again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's that's very interesting. And then um uh so would you say that that's not a pain anymore or is that something that you know you're still finding yourself going in and out of no no i think that's not a pain anymore not at all Hmm. and um i'm curious in um having your son uh what was the challenge of um seeing him grow up and you know, kind of relating to how you were growing up and, you know, seeing all these stages. Did it teach you something about yourself and your childhood? Huh. Sorry, I don't know. Do you have a kid? I don't, but I, this is okay. what I would imagine I would be learning. Okay. <laughs> I No, it's funny. A lot of people say that. It's, I didn't have a kid until I was... Until much later. So he was mm-hmm. born when I was 42 mm-hmm. and he's 10 now. Um, mm-hmm. So I think that maybe like if I would have had a kid at 21, 
there more of a connect between my childhood and my child, but not having a kid until I was 42. And then at that point, my life, like my childhood feels like it was like three lifetimes ago, you know, it's like very faint, distant memories. And it was a different era too. I was born Mm -hmm. in the 60s, you know, like it was such a different time. And so maybe I could blame all these things, but maybe it's just that I just don't see that much of a connection between them. Um, Mm -hmm. He is not me. His life is not my life. Uh, I don't really project my childhood or I don't project my child on onto him and I also don't protect uh, project my parents parenting of me like I'm not channeling that people say that a lot too like oh you're going to end up acting just like your parents but Mm -hmm. no not at all I don't at all because that was so long ago I'm Mm -hmm. 52 I left home when I was 16 17 and haven't you know been back to my parents since so how they parented me when I was a kid is so far away and faint that no, I'm not channeling that. Instead, I think what I do, um, I think what I do parenting wise for my son is like trying to be the best parent I can be. And that's through reading books, learning about parenting, deliberately applying what I've learned from the books, um, Mm -hmm. like doing what I think is the right thing to do, whether I feel like it or not. But then also just responding to his unique situation. I mean, the -hmm. the dynamic between the two of us is um, he's the leader and I'm the follower. So I really just like let him lead the way. um, And then metaphorically, I just catch him if he's about to jump off a cliff, you know, Uh, Mm -hmm. where I say like, just you lead the way, I'll follow you. And we do what he wants to do and we, uh, go where he wants to go he sets the path and tone and then only if i get the feeling that he's going to hurt himself in some way uh i'll stop him or if i get the feeling uh, again i'll just use the metaphor like hey if you were to just step on top of that rock and look over you'd see that there's a huge field of flowers down there i might occasionally just give him a little nudge saying like all right you're leading the way but you know check this out try this um And then in the the whole time, keeping in mind what I've learned about parenting from the wise books I've found on the subject and just trying to apply it. Um, yeah, but my own, as, as, so as you can hear, like my own childhood has nothing, nothing to, do. to do with this process. Yeah, that's that's, again, a very interesting thing uh, when I'm when as I'm listening to you, there is something that, again, I really like and I partly wanted to discuss about the book which is you somehow live grounded in the now and kind of make decisions about the now um and it's but then again you know there is a part of living in the future but uh gestalt therapy is uh, the one i'm studying is about how do you get to the here and now and make decisions that what is it that we can do here and now with the best of knowledge from the past and with the information we can gather now because obviously we can't process uh amount of information that's about everything and kind of predict every outcome and so you in the book when i read it i was like that's why i say it's kind of like an oracle it's if i feel like i need more past going more towards the Mm. past I can go and mm-hmm. read, how do I do that? If I feel like I need more of this spice, I can go and read how to do that. But then there is um, one of the therapists says that it takes years to be present in the here and now, especially for a lot of people who have gone through trauma because mm. uh, they often react from this past space and project it onto the current moment. So my curiosity lies in how do you get grounded in let me see what's now hmm sorry i don't have any big insight into this except Mm -hmm. meditation like i don't even regularly meditate but Mm -hmm. i've done it just enough to know how it goes Mm -hmm. and I think it's kind of like that, that I just, you catch yourself having a thought, Mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. um, about the future or the past. And um, my metaphor is I just chuck it in the river. Uh, I often, when meditating, kind of picture myself sitting by a river. Um, not a big, you know, uh, forest around me. I just picture just the river, almost like an empty VR room with nothing but a river. And whenever any thought of the past or future mm -hmm. comes in to my head, I just chuck it in the river and the river carries it away. Um, so that's, to me, just the basic, you know, meditation 101, right? Mm -hmm. um, these things come into your head and you just let them go. Because you know that they'll, if it's important, it'll come back later. Yeah. Um, and I think maybe when doing it, See, when I do it with work, I'm just completely engrossed in the work itself. You know, whether I'm writing or I'm programming, um, I'm just completely lost in what I'm doing, so much so I didn't, you know, don't notice that it's getting dark outside, right? Um, I'm just engrossed. And then when I'm with my kid, I think another thing we didn't mention is that, for me, I believe that the stakes are so high, so, so, so high, that... Meaning, I've seen too many times people's lives were messed up multi-generationally because they had a traumatic childhood, which then they traumatize their child's life, and then that child goes on to traumatize their children's life. Um, and it passes down for so many generations. This thing mm -hmm. like those, those people that are just intensely angry and resentful inside, and they yell at the people, the loved ones in their life. They treat strangers beautifully, but then they treat their loved ones terribly what the hell is that why do so many people do that um i never ever ever want to do that to me like any trauma stops here i am not passing any of this on to my kid um or or there's things where too many parents um are with their kids while they're just scrolling their phones and they're like uh-huh mm -hmm. uh-huh yeah oh, that's nice dear okay whatever you know, yeah. and they're lost in their screen. And I think of what is that doing to a kid's psyche? Yeah. Teaching a kid through example that that apparently what's on this little piece of glass matters much more than me, matters much more than life. All that matters, according to my parents that I look at and emulate, is what's going on in this little piece of glass. I'm looking at mom and dad, and that's what I see them do. That's what I'm going to do in my life. My parents are showing me that's what you do. So I never want to do that um, because the stakes are so high. I want him to have mm. a great life and a healthy outlook on life. So I would just do these things like never uh, be on my phone around my kid. Anytime I'm with mm. him, the phone is shut down. Not just put away. Like I hold down the power button for three seconds until it goes completely turns yeah. off. And I'm just completely present with him. Um, and even when I catch myself... Um, say, upset about something in the past or worried about something in the future, I go, ah, wait, what am I doing? No, I'm just with my kid now. Let it go. Toss it in the river. And I just give him my full attention because mm -hmm. this is super, super, super important. Yeah, mm -hmm. stakes are high. And I'm curious, what was the... Um what was the most surprising thing you discovered about your kids that you were like, hmm, that's so cool and I, you're so different in this than me? Mm -hmm. Maybe just that he's, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say they're big surprises, um, except that he's just not into music. <laughs> I kind of thought that <laughs> I would instill that in him. You know, we've been listening to music since he was born. I always kind of mm -hmm. surrounded him with really interesting music like not just pop, but I'd put on you know, Debussy or Indian classical music or Persian music or, or um, took him to the orchestra. I had a season tickets to the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra. And so for three years of his life, from age, say, four to seven, um, every two weeks we were sitting, you know, fifth row center in front of the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra um, for whatever they happened to be playing that night, whether it's, you know, Berlioz or Ravel or... Mozart or whatever, um, and he grew up with the sound of the orchestra, and yet despite all of that, he's just not into music. So, all right, that's his thing. Mm, that's right. And On the so, other hand, he's 10. I didn't really get into music till I was 14, yeah. so maybe suddenly at 14 he'll be super into it. I don't know. So what he is in, 
uh, into uh, when he's in his ten. <laughs> Building weapons. He likes to build weapons. That's all he cares about. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, and so another thing about the book uh, is uh, the weird conclusion. And uh, maybe you want to say something about that before I ask the questions so that people who may have not read the book uh, can actually know what we're talking about. Sure. Um, so for anybody listening, <laughs> if you haven't figured this out by now, the book How to Live is 27 conflicting answers to that question and then one weird conclusion. So that's the subtitle of the book, 27 Conflicting Answers and One Weird Conclusion. So as I was writing it, I was writing the book for two years, not knowing how I was going to end it. I knew that I wanted to have these chapters that completely disagreed with each other. So one chapter would say, here's how to live, live completely for the future. And then the next chapter would say, here's how to live, treasure the past and the next chapter would say here's how to live live completely in the moment and the next chapter would say here's how to live get rich um i knew that i was going to have these conflicting chapters but i didn't know how to end it and um and then two i encountered an image uh of a duck and a bunny like an optical illusion is this a duck or is this a bunny and i went oh <gasps> this is the conclusion. And then as I kept writing, I thought of one more thing that made me think, ah, oh, this is the conclusion. And both of them then were just a single image. So here's the book of 118 pages of words. And then all of that is one section of the book. And then the final section is just two pages, which is just mm -hmm. two images. Um, one of the duck and bunny and one of the orchestra, orchestra. like the or orchestra seating chart. Mm -hmm. And at first I thought I was going to keep these a secret, but the book's been out for a while now. So I guess I'm happy to talk about it. And we'll just say, yeah. if you haven't read the book yet, spoil alert, Alex yes. is about to ask some questions. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the question for me was, uh, what did that duck and bunny, when you saw them, mean for you? Because I know what they mean for me and what I saw in that. But what was that for you when you were like, this fits? <laughs> it was the epiphany that you don't have to choose. Is this a duck or is this a bunny? The answer is, this is a picture of a duck and a bunny. That it is both. Like this drawing that someone made mm -hmm. is a duck and it is a bunny. It is a drawing of a duck and bunny in one image. And the epiphany for how to live our lives is you don't have to choose. You don't have to say, should I be living for the future moment or should I be living in the present? Should I focus on getting rich or should I focus on following the pain? You can take the duck and bunny lesson and say, ah, I don't have to choose. It's and, not or. Mm. That you can follow the pain in some aspects of your life and get rich in other aspects of your life and live in the present in some aspects and live for the future in other aspects. And it might be during different times of your life or you might just completely combine them and say, I'm mm. doing both. Yes. Mm. That was uh, maybe one of the biggest outcomes of my personal psychotherapy, where I was like always very poetic, but then I was a scientist, but then I was uh, um, like I'm drawing and then I'm doing all these kind of different things. And I was always like everyone say, you know, there's part of the book where it's like be focused or I don't know if that's the, the name of the chapter, but it's along those lines. Mm -hmm. And I was always like. I have it even in my diary where it's like, this is the year of trying to focus. <laughs> and, mm. then, and then I kind of realized, not me and probably not now, maybe at some day where I actually have to and I'm maybe obliged to, I will find that in myself, but I don't want to find it now. And so I'm mm. curious, um, there is an image for me of you uh, of like an, a kaleidoscope, you know, like someone who is like a, white beam of light and then it just kind of 
going through through, through this nice. <laughs> uh, through this uh, mirror where it's like you know shining through with different colors and i'm i'm curious like maybe what was the one of those colors which just didn't feel right for you and it took you time to actually sit in and fit in to mm. kind of that there's a chapter called do nothing ah, yeah. um <laughs> which if you channel all of the the buddhist meditative monk wisdom it's you know you don't have to do anything um mm. you can just be in the present people say you have to react no you don't people say you have to do this no you don't um you don't have to do anything mm. that one is the least natural to me but um it actually made more sense when i thought of it as preparing for death because if you realize that once you die or even as you're like on your deathbed as they say you really can't do anything anymore um all these things you think you have to do you can't anymore and perhaps a way of finding peace before those final days of your life is to get rid of as many obligations as possible to make it so that you feel the least um obligation to do anything so that when that day comes that you're either completely incapacitated or paralyzed or uh or dead <laughs> that you can feel okay about that because you've already internalized the lesson that you don't have to do anything yeah Wow, I really love this because I went on a workshop uh, which was about um, the, my true nature. And I was kind of thinking, oh, I'm going to understand what's my calling or what should I do? And, and the outcome of that workshop is that our true nature is mortality. <laughs> and mm. uh, and uh, it was quite kind of calming to look at that. Um, mm -hmm. And another thing that came to me as you were talking is one of the person I interviewed, he said, we don't have free will, but we have free won't. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> what does that mean? It's, it's cute, but what does it mean? I mean, to me, what it means is, is exactly do nothing. Nothing is, a, is almost a no thing. <laughs> so hmm. uh, often we think we are powerless, but in a way our power lies in not doing sometimes. Um, hmm. And so to me, exactly this acceptance of, of the no and, and knowing that even my no is a power um, was, was very liberating. At least that's what it means for me. I don't hmm. know, maybe you hear something else, cool. but yeah. Hmm. Um, and the the orchestra the orchestra again uh i know what it means for me well what it means for you <laughs> all right do you want to tell me yours first uh yes i can uh so the way i saw it is that um again our life is our our masterpiece <laughs> and uh, we can be the conductor of it or I can be the conductor of it and I can create the melody of it uh, that I have with whatever is in my personal orchestra. <laughs> and I might mm. have only, as it's like almost like a, a forest gum kind of thing. You know, you might have four colors, but you can still draw incredible images with that. Um, and you still have the power to draw. Uh, so... Mm. Uh, yeah, what I, what I saw in that is that we have the power to create with whatever is given to us uh, at our disposal. Well, cool. I like <laughs> That's that. my projection. That, that, was not, that was not as intended, but I, I like that. I'm so glad that I left the ending ambiguous like that mm -hmm. because I'm so glad that you looked at that and thought about what that could mean that to me is so much more interesting than a book ending with you know and let me tell you here's exactly the mm. conclusion here's what you should think 
um, it's more artistic that way. You know, my favorite movies mm -hmm. are the ones that end with an ambiguity. Mm -hmm. And suddenly the movie's done and you go, wait, but what, what, did they meet or not? Did How did it? And you think, oh, mm -hmm. that's beautiful. It's beautiful that they left it open mm -hmm. like that. Um, so that's, yeah, that's what I did with How to Live. But, all right, we gave the spoiler alert, and you asked, so here we are, um, one hour into our conversation. I will spoil the ending completely. <laughs> um, to me, the orchestra, I think of it as actually quite musical. You'll notice in the orchestra seating chart, there are 27 instruments. No coincidence, the 27 chapters with the 27 different ways to live. So the 27 instruments are supposed to represent the 20 different, 27 different ways to live. And if you are the uh, composer of an orchestra, then you don't have to answer which instrument is correct. Uh, you don't have to decide, am I going to use the flute or am I going to use the clarinet? You can do both. And... Uh, not just that, but of course, every piece of music that uses an orchestra has different instruments coming in and out at different times. Mm -hmm. So the big idea is to use time. Like music is sound in time, right? So to use time, the time of your life, there are times mm -hmm. in your life where the correct thing to do is to get rich, just as there are times in your life where the or times in a composition where the correct thing to do is to let only the cellos play for a while. And mm -hmm. then while you are getting rich, uh, you need to focus on love for a little while. And it seems like those are conflicting, but hey, you've got the cellos playing now and you're bringing in the oboe uh, at the same time as the cellos are playing. You can mix them. Mm -hmm. um, you can use time and you com combine the different ways to live throughout time, bring them in and out as needed. And that's where the conductor idea comes in is then the conductor's job is to kind of do this like, okay, give me more, 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 give me more of this. Okay, ah, there we go. Stop, slow down, a little less of you, a little more of this. And that's your job as the conductor of your life is to look at all these different ways you could be approaching life. Um, following the pain versus following pleasure, living in the moment versus living for the future. And it's your job as the composer in the first place and then the conductor in the moment to combine and bring these in and out as needed. Mm. And another interesting addition for me is that as a composer and as you were writing your book, you don't need to know the ending and you don't need them to know the melody. You can also create it as you go. Mm. And so that was a... That, that's another thing that, for example, these drawings... Um, taught me is that I can let myself unfold rather than put myself into a box and want to fit myself into that box <laughs> and nice. it's like uh, I feel like again the melody can unfold it doesn't need to be a preconceived composition that we mm. we need to create so that's quite interesting and oh, I'm almost jealous and I kind of would love uh and I might write in the um, in the show notes, but it would be really cool to hear what other people that have read the book had projected into these images. Did, he, did oh. you get any answers to that? Lots. So if you go okay. to the the web page for the book is mm -hmm. S-I-V-E dot R-S slash H, as in the first letter of how to live. Um just go to sive.rs slash h, and if you scroll down, you'll start to see the reviews that people have left. And a lot of people in their reviews say what this book meant to them. And some of them mention the ending image. Some of them just kind of holistically say, like, I saw, like you said, when you emailed me, you said this book was like a Rorschach test. Yeah. And I was like, yes, that's great. That's ideal. And some other people say, um, this book to me, uh, is a spoof of the self-help genre where the self-help genre, each book acts like it has the answer to life and you are spoofing these other books by showing that there is no answer, you know, by putting them all together in one book and contradictory. And, and they're not wrong either. That was, that was in the original intention as well. 
Um, and then some people just take completely surprising things out of it. Um, so yeah, go to the webpage for it and you'll see everybody's reviews down below. Yeah, and I'm very curious. And I actually never, I didn't uh, manage to ask this question, but how did you get the idea to actually write the book? What was that <laughs> first uh, seed inkling? Um, there is a book called Sum, S-U-M, by David mm -hmm. Eagleman. And I love the format of this book. It's one of my favorite books of all time. It's a tiny little book. The subtitle is 40 Tales from the Afterlives. So it's 40 little short stories, just two to three pages long each, of what happens when you die. Mm -hmm. And I love this format that um, every little chapter answers the question differently. It's like the title is saying, what happens when you die? And each chapter says, when you die, you find out that in the last life where you were a creature, but in the next life, you can be whatever creature you want to be, so you decide to be a horse. The next chapter will say, when you die, you awaken in a mansion that is empty. <laughs> you walk around all the rooms for the longest time, you don't find anybody else. Eventually, you find out that this is God's mansion, and he left a long time ago and doesn't know we exist. The next chapter will say, uh, when you die, you find out that you were an artificial intelligence program. And the creatures that wrote you want to know the answer of life. And the next chapter will say, when you die. So I just love this format that it's like every little chapter, every few pages is completely disagreeing with all of the other chapters. And I was like, oh, I love this. I love this. It's so beautiful uh, to deliberately contradict yourself over and over again in one book to answer one question in 40 different ways, almost like a creative challenge, right? Like the, yes. the author probably thinking. said... Yes, Sorry. yes. Yeah. How many different ways can I answer this question of what happens when you die? Mm. And I read that book. I read it again a year later. And shortly after reading it the second time, I was driving down the road on a long highway in New Zealand with, you know, my mind was just wandering. And suddenly I went, oh, I want to write a book called How to Live. <laughs> and it's going to be like some where it's going to answer the question of how to live in like 40 different ways. I was like, oh my God, yes. I got so excited about this that as soon as I had the idea, I just, brrr, my fingers started flying and I couldn't stop. And so for the next two years, I wrote this book filled with everything I had ever learned. I wanted to put everything I had ever learned in my life into this one book. And so the first draft was like 1300 pages. And of course, nobody would actually want to read that. Um, you know, maybe 12 people somewhere. So then... To make it beautiful, I wanted to now take this 1300 page thing and compress it down into just, you know, 100. And, it turned out to be 115 pages, I think. Um, so each sentence you see in the book How to Live Now used to be an entire page. Almost every page got reduced down to one sentence that I very wow. carefully crafted to represent what used to be a whole page. And I'm really proud of it that way. Wow. So you did your own editing, basically. Yeah. Wow. I'm just now imagining as you're saying this, like like a big marble, and like you, like the the first thing was like 1,300 pages, and then like you were slowly like you know chipping off so that you can make this. <laughs> yeah. Well, just to get ridiculous, if you're talking about a big block of marble, like three meters tall, then I'm like the sculptor that would like keep doing it until in the end, all you would yeah, have yeah. is a tiny little <laughs> swan the size of your thumb. You know? <laughs> exactly. That's how it sounds. But it's like an incredible feat. So I'm quite amazed and I'm happy I asked this question. <laughs> and then... Um, <laughs> Sorry, take me a moment to stop laughing. But uh... No, I mean, that's funny. It's, here's something I, I'm embarrassed to talk about is that I am so fucking proud of this book. Like, I I love it so much. I think this is, like, my favorite book ever. Like, not just my favorite book that I've written. I mean, like, my mm -hmm. favorite book ever. Like, it's the way that I wonder if filmmakers feel like this when they make a great film that they've worked for years on. It's they made this film because it it didn't exist until this moment. And then when it's done, I wonder how many filmmakers feel like this is my favorite film ever. Or like how many musicians, when you write a song that never existed till this moment and you nail it, you make it like, you, you really capture what you wanted to do with that song. 
And I wonder how many musicians then feel like, I think this is my favorite song. Like, we're not supposed to admit that. But of course it's in there. As a creator of anything, you're creating what you want to exist, what you wish existed. And if you achieve it well, then it's like, well, then this, in theory, then should be your favorite thing of all time. And yeah, that's how I feel about how to live. It's like my favorite book ever. (laughs) I mean, honestly... Uh, as I'm talking to you, that's why I'm laughing because it, I can see the joy it brings to you and it brings even yeah. more joy to me to see that someone has actually done that for themselves. And that's basically living your own dream. Is that yeah. what dreams are until they actually become yeah. reality? And uh, yeah. and so it's quite incredible to witness a creator that has made it. And it doesn't matter like well, how it's going to impact me or how it's going to impact someone yeah. else because everyone, eventually people will project whatever they need to project into it. But mm-hmm. if the composition is sturdy enough, uh, it will uh, it will keep, it will um, kind of absorb those projections. <laughs> and I think, yeah. sorry, say it. Or just even if, you love it a much and exactly. love what you've made enough, then it just doesn't really matter what anyone else thinks. So every exactly. now and then exactly. I hear from somebody who doesn't like the book. I'm like, okay, whatever. Yes. Like that doesn't it's bother my me favorite at thing all. ever. Yeah. yeah <laughs> I don't that. care. It's my favorite. Yeah. Yeah. No, that that's exactly it. That that's uh, that's the feeling where I know when I've done something that I really like and I might not even like it after some time, but like for now it's really something hmm. that makes me feel I've expressed it looks like what I wanted to express and it feels good that nice. you have the tools to do it. And uh, one thing I um, stayed with after reading it, I did feel you've put everything you know into it. It does feel like that. Uh, and uh, what I wanted to ask is what's, a, because there are, I see them sometimes as tools or as kind of you have your own toolkit for life. And I was curious, what's something that you're like, I still want to learn this. It's like, I haven't had the chance mm. to get my hands on. Now this book is behind me and I really want to learn this new thing. I never studied philosophy. Um, and so I'd like to learn more about what other philosophers have said um, and thought much more about. And I, I'm going to have to get through the jargon that's a problem mm-hmm. with like academic philosophy is yeah. when they like all this jargon around it that to me just seems completely detached from how we live our life. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'd like to kind of learn to see through the gar- jargon and get mm-hmm. to the thoughts behind it. Um, there's something that I'm fascinated with right now, which is the beliefs that we hold that are useful to us, but not true. So I may choose to believe if I'm running a race and I want to run the fastest I can, I might choose to believe that there's a tiger behind me chasing me. And if I slow down for even one millisecond that that tiger will kill me, I know that that belief is not true, but that might help me to believe to get me to where I want to go. or like we talked earlier about the safety net tightrope metaphor, it served me well to believe that I had a safety net, even though later I found out that wasn't true. So there's some things that we can choose to believe knowing in advance, this isn't true, but I'm going to believe it anyway. Then there are things that we choose to believe that might or might not be true, but believing it works for us. Mm. So... Yeah, that interests me right now. And I think that's probably going to be my next book called mm. Useful, Not True. Mm, I love that. I, it's interesting, again, in therapy. Uh, I'm sorry I'm making so many references, but that's my life. Yeah, please. Now. I love uh, it. <laughs> um, there is a part of me which I know that the metaphor uh, or whatever I'm creating in this moment is probably going to going against all my scientific <laughs> training and yet it just feels good when i think of that and i'm like Mm. it just feels nice to think in these terms and to just bring it to just calm my nervous system down and yet like i i always wonder is it's like and you know 
often is like, who am I to take away someone else's illusions that hold them mm. safe or grounded? Or because there, there's always this question, even in therapy, what's good therapy? And hmm. do I want to bring someone to see the same reality as I do, or do I want to feel them more right. safe in their own reality? Right. And uh, and and there's that's where the question sits with me, is because in a way, often realities as constructivist therapists would say it is whatever we agree on that reality is, until we hmm. agree on it differently. Mm -hmm. um, and so. I guess for me, what where this has a particular problem is when I feel when there is like abuse or when there is something that's life threatening and we are not sharing mm -hmm. the same reality. So I always end up if I if I follow my train of thought, everything is accepted, everything is good, and we can be both end. And yet, when I came to a, when I come to a moment of I don't know, an actual physical attack or a sexual attack or things of that sort where then I'm like, well, I can be compassionate. I can get your reality. But this edge of thought, I have, it's an impasse for me and I don't know how to mentally deal with it, basically. Mm. So that's where I'm curious, like, how do I use them as useful and yet shake them when they're threatening? Interesting. Um, Isn't it? See, when I think of useful, to me, the the implied meaning of that is useful for what you want, like where you want to go, or useful mm -hmm. for who you want to be. Um, it gets you to where you want to go. It empowers you. Mm -hmm. To me, useful implies all these things. It's empowering. Mm -hmm. It gets you. So let's say if somebody were to criticize this core idea of it's good to believe what's useful to you not what's necessarily true somebody could criticize that saying okay but are you saying then that somebody um might find it useful to believe that people they don't like are subhuman and therefore can be yeah uh, uh murdered then it's like well if what you're where you're trying to go is to be a mass murderer, <laughs> then that is a useful belief. But if where you're trying to go is to be a mass murderer, um, then there are other issues that we should be addressing, not you know useful or true. Um, yeah. That it's it's where you want to go. So I think most people want to go to a healthy place. They want to be not just happy, but flourishing. They want to be like a congruently happy person yeah. um, that's deeply happy, not just shallow happy. Um, and then believing things that are useful to get you to where you want to go or to get you to be who you want to be. Um, those beliefs you adopt don't have to be proven true as mm -hmm. long as the belief works for your psyche to help you take the actions and make the change in your life to get you where you want to go. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I do get that. It's just like I'm, I'm always stuck as exactly what the the example you mentioned is like. Mm -hmm. Well, even as a therapist, when when do you intervene, <laughs> and who mm. do you talk to? Because it's like, it's you can see that it's useful and it supports and it's a it supports the system they have created for themselves. And yet that what's useful for them is kind of threatening for the environment. So, and then there's like this huge clash. I, I mean, see. So you're saying working as a therapist with people that have the feeling like they're either being directly violent or emotionally abusive, abusive. to others. Yeah. Okay. Because then like, mm. you know, it always comes to the clockwork orange movie for me. I don't know if you watched it, mm -hmm. Uh but it always comes to that point. I mean, I guess for him, it has been useful to be who he is. And like this idea of trying to change his personality is kind of totally, well, it seems ah. very, you know. So there is this, uh, like, 
I always uh, like that's that's where my psyche is still kind of not sure, uh, especially like again going through a war and like you know, like having a very vivid experience where like there's places where it's difficult to have compassion and where I can see like okay psyche is self regulated and there is a way we can find a place to heal and not transmit trauma but then <laughs> and yet there is still people who would intentionally inflict trauma and so how do you mm. so there are these things which are kind of on an impasse and and that's where like yeah that useful thing is always uh, a trick for me but we don't have mm. to answer it now i guess uh, i leave no. it as a question <laughs> no and i'm glad you brought it up because it's funny the uh, it's like before we teach somebody how to drive or before we focus on how to drive we should make sure that the person driving is not going to be using that car to go run down people <laughs> yeah. yeah like that needs to sense. come first uh, yeah. where you want to go comes first before we talk about the tools you use to get there exactly exactly uh one thing that's still coming for me which we discussed before we started the interview which is like i said oh i want to see raw derek whatever that means <laughs> And uh, what is what do you think is the rawest thing about you that maybe doesn't come through uh, when people uh, project things onto you, or doesn't come across not through? Um, I don't know. Um, maybe I'd be less to know. Um, <laughs> people who know me well have said that. Um, that my public and private persona is very congruent. Like this is just who I am. There's mm. not, it's not like I'm putting on this persona now. And then as soon as we hang up the phone, I'm like an angry bastard that's yelling and hitting my kid or, you know, um, that, that no, it's pretty congruent. Um, I think that I really spend almost all of my time um, just sitting and typing unless I'm with my kid, then I stop all of that. And I'm just with him. And that's really my whole life. It's like my life is very, very, very simple by design. Mm. Like I don't say yes to hardly anything, I take on no mm. responsibilities. That's part of why I don't do things for money. You know, a lot of people have commented when they go to my site that, um, that it's surprising that I don't have the usual pop up ads like you know, sign up for my course, please buy this. Hey, you know, like I, I'm not even doing analytics to try to convert people into money makers. But that's because I already years ago, like I sold my company for more money than I'll be able to use in my lifetime. And I don't want any more. Um, because I think that would just complicate my life. Like there's nothing I want to mm -hmm. buy. Um, anything else I could own in my life would make my life more complicated. So I think the um, maybe something that doesn't come across is just how simple my private life is. Mm -hmm. Like there's really not much more to it. Yeah, I mean that's that's where where I kind of see my life heading. But I can I guess because I haven't passed that stage of getting rich, <laughs> it's mm -hmm. that simplicity is also something that. Sometimes I imagine life with like, you start with simplicity, but this kind of naive simplicity. And then you go through all this complexity to kind of experience. And then you can distill it back into simplicity, but it's almost like a wise one. I don't know if I, mm. I mean, that's my imagination, but it might not resonate at all. You know what? That, that might be, um, I mean, I agree with you. I think that's kind of the ideal. Um, I'm just remembering that the fact is, when I was making a living in New York City in my 20s as a full-time musician, the way to make a living as a musician in New York City is to say yes to everything. Like, I had to take every gig that came my way. I had to go mm -hmm. pursue gigs. I had to learn new styles of music in order to get a gig playing jazz guitar. And then I had to learn how to play a little classical piano in order to get a gig doing that. And I had to learn how to do that. Like I had to, my life had to be kind of complicated because that was the way to make a living mm -hmm. as a freelance musician. So only then later, like as I started CD Baby and my life got simpler, I started like letting go of everything else and did this. 
And then it got simpler. And then once I sold my company, then my life got very simple. Now I didn't have to do anything I didn't want to do anymore. So it is, I think it's circumstantial. It's not like mm -hmm. somebody, say like my freelance musician self of the past or somebody who's currently a freelance freelancer, let's just leave it as a freelancer in general, probably shouldn't be simplifying their life too much because mm -hmm. that would not be the correct strategy for success as a freelancer, mm -hmm. which may be to say yes to everything. Um, and later in your life, at a different time in your life, at a different situation, then the correct strategy is to say no to everything. But these, mm -hmm. these strategies... Uh, change over time. You can't just say, this is the right answer and yeah. this is what I'm going to be using for life. It's all situational. Yeah. Uh, also, I want to ask something that I really love, uh, which again, I don't know the exact names of the chapters, but there's a chapter about traveling and getting as many passports and getting more experiences. And, um, and I love that. Uh, and I'm curious, what are, what were, when you went out of the US for the first time, all the US is very international anyways so it's it's a bit different than when i go out from serbia but um what do you think that you started to realize is your collective unconscious are these kind of beliefs that were part of your culture that you just took on because you didn't question them everyone was thinking the same around you and then you came out and you went into new culture and you're like you guys never thought this through. <laughs> yeah. So I'm curious for people who are living in the US particularly, what, what's that? Um, in the US, we, we think that individualism is like the highest good. <laughs> individualism is the, the ultimate ideal. And that might be shaped by the cowboy mentality this idea of like, nope, I'll go at my own. Mm -hmm. You know, I, the, even in a lot of these uh, hero movies, I won't even say superhero, but like, let's forget the Marvel movies for a minute. But even like these hero movies, you know, there's a bunch of people doing a thing. And then in the final moment, it's just the one person who, who goes out to get the bad guy by himself. And, uh, and that's celebrated as like the ultimate ideal. So yeah, the, the individualism that I just took is just a given. Like, well, of course, individual mm -hmm. achievement is just the best thing ever. That's what it's all about. And then I moved to Singapore where people would tell me things like, well, I really wanted to be a musician, but my parents said no, so I stopped. And I'm like, no, how could you? No, that's wrong. You need to follow your dreams. And they would tell me like, well, no, it's my family's wishes matter. And I'd say, no, they shouldn't. Fuck your family. <laughs> you know, do what you want. And it took me a couple of years of living in Singapore and meeting hundreds of Singaporeans, like not just, you know, meeting it nice to meet you, but like real two-way conversations over hundreds of hours. And slowly the mindset started to sink in that, yeah, what is best for your group matters more than what's best for you it's the greater good. And that group might be your immediate family. It might be your neighborhood. It might be your community. Your, it could be your greater family, your extended family. It could be your community. It could even be your country. And this idea that, um, well, I'm not going to pursue my dream to be a poet because what's for the greater good for my family is for me to get a degree as an engineer so I can make mm -hmm. more money and support my family. And it was really hard for me to understand that that was right, not wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think to just wrap up, is there anything about the book or yourself, which you feel like I haven't asked you, uh, <laughs> that you would still uh, want to add? Uh, and we can, because potentially it can open a new... 20 minute topic <laughs> <laughs> right yeah here here are the numbers we have discussed are there any numbers that exist that we have not discussed yeah <laughs> um <laughs> yes there are um <laughs> um no i really appreciate the way that you um you take your psychotherapy angle um 
into things. Yeah, you said, I can't remember if it was right before or after we hit record that you said that you wanted to try to get into the raw Derek. And so I tried to, um, I think I was very unfiltered. The only place I draw the line is like you know, not mentioning my romantic partner's personal life, uh, like to leave them out of it. But um, yeah, I tried to get as personal as possible. So thanks mm -hmm. for going to that place instead of keeping it at the shallow, um, the shallow businessy kind of level that a lot of mm. interviews do. Mm, that's a compliment. So I, I will take that one. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a rapid fire, two rapid fire questions. One is what is an absurd thing about you that not many people know about that people would not connect to you? Absurd. Oh, that people would not. OK, well, the simplicity thing, I really take that to an absurd level. Mm -hmm. Like I really only have one pair of pants. Um, okay, and wow. yesterday I did the laundry. And so I had to just kind of like be in my underwear for a few hours until the laundry was done. Um, <laughs> but I think a lot of people would guess that about me. Um, mm -hmm. What's absurd about me? Hold on. It, I think it, that's more like what's incongruent about me. Um, I'm a minimalist in almost every way, but when it comes to... <laughs> When it comes to my file backups, I'm not. I know this is a really specific <laughs> thing, but like I have two computers that are clones of each other, a, a desktop and a laptop. And every day I sync them out of this kind of paranoia that at any moment, one of them could completely die and stop working. And I never want to stop working. So that's why every night I sync these two computers so that they're clones of each other. Um, and then my files that matter to me, which is like all of my writing uh, my home movies of my kid, my photos and stuff like that. Um, I have backed up on like four places on four continents, <laughs> right? Like I, every week I back them up and I have a server in the U S and a server in Europe and a server in Asia and a server in New Zealand that I back up my files to all four of these. So it's like minimal. My life is minimalist in many ways, but when it comes to my file backups, and my main tool, which is a general purpose computer, I make sure that it's my life is not too simple in those ways, because that would mean like single point of failure. That's a that's an other interesting thing as someone who has. Um, so we had uh, electricity restrictions in Serbia. So basically, to me, thinking that the world might lose electricity at some point is something that I take very seriously. So yes. I, I I'm wondering, do you have that in mind? And what would be the yeah. memories you would you would want to keep in case that happens? <laughs> yeah, well the the to me the the videos of my son are precious mm -hmm. uh, that I've made from of him since he was born. My diaries are precious, my writing is precious, um my computer code is precious. That's actually you probably the the side of me that the public does not see is I put more hours into my computer programming than I do into my writing and nobody ever mm -hmm. sees it. Um, but yeah, I'm really deliberately like, consciously pessimistic about things like that, that um, we could get a, uh, you call it like a coronal mass injection or where like a solar flare might just not just knock out all electricity, but might also kind of fry your hard drives um uh losing internet at any point is really common to me maybe because i got online in 1994 when the internet was still like you'd use a dial-up modem to dial in and then sometimes it just wouldn't work for a day and so that's why i still i don't use google docs or any of these tools that are always online i do everything offline that matters um because i'm never counting on the internet working um I do use very low power. Sorry, I'm looking over here at my computer. I use very <laughs> like low power electronics so that if I lose electricity, I can go off of battery backup for a long time. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, things like that. I'm, I'm deliberately pessimistic about. Uh... Actually, no, you know, there's a reason that, that in the How to Live book, that the very first chapter was like, be independent. That one matters mm -hmm. a lot to me. Like I'm always very, very wary of when I'm dependent on a company or a service or anything like that. I try to make sure that I'm never too dependent on any particular service or technology. Mm -hmm. 
And so the last question, is there any question you have for me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, yeah, but um, I think I have like an hour of questions <laughs> I would want to ask you. I mean, that's why we first spoke, you know, we, yeah. I think we spoke in 2019. Yeah. Um, but like just as friends, because you just seemed like a really interesting person that mm -hmm. I want to know. Uh, so I have probably 100 questions for you, but... Someday we'll reverse the podcast format. Yes, that will be amazing. <laughs> but, yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to that. So thank you very much. And I, yeah, thank you for your honesty. This was and for your time, because as you said, you said no to many things. And I appreciate that you said yes to me. So thank you. <laughs> I really appreciated your take on how to live when you said, oh, you know, we should close with the I love that you taught me this quote that yeah, life is not a problem to be solved, but a uh, an adventure to be experienced. A paradox, yeah, a paradox. to be uh, managed, so, yeah. To, to me, like, I, I wouldn't even say managed there. So to me, that captures the essence of the book, How to Live, which is like, life mm -hmm. is not a problem to be solved. You know, the title, How to Live, mm -hmm. is basically sarcastic. This book does not teach you how to live. It's making fun of the fact that we could even say how to live, uh, but a paradox to be experienced. So mm -hmm. thank you so much for... Uh, the attention you've given this book that I love. I really appreciate it. You have just heard the story of Derek Sivers, a musician, producer, circus performer, entrepreneur, best known for his company CD Baby, TED speaker and book publisher. He's a monomaniac, introvert, slow thinker and loves finding a different point of view. He is a California native and now lives in New Zealand. If you want to find more about him and connect to him, you can visit his webpage, sive.rs thank you for joining me on this journey and please share and subscribe so that these stories can reach more people